supporter. My name is Grace Dixon. Um, I am interviewing you for my history capstone paper. Um, and so I have a few questions that I'd like to ask you. All right. So can you give me a brief background about yourself? <laughs> a brief background would be I was born in Athens, Kansas, and um, um, moved to Sioux Falls in 1956, that's 60 some years ago. Um, Sioux Falls was a, a really a different community when I moved here. There was a lot of, you know, segregation, different things like that. Um, but I know, um, I kind of like Sioux Falls, but then there's times that I hated Sioux Falls. And, uh, but we changed, you know, when I say we, uh, there was other black people that helped change the city and make it, um, uh, more integrated, let's put it that way. So, what drew you to art making and art itself? Well, I kind of do everything. I mean, I make things, I uh, paint, but most of all, I'm a sculptor. I'm th three-dimensional. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that takes a different, it's a different mindset, you know, than, um, when you draw, I used to draw, and uh, I can't draw. <laughs> and then I uh, went to Santa Barbara uh, City College and learned how to oil paint. Okay. And I, uh, it was, you know, I could paint a lot better than I could draw. And then I got to a point to where all my life I wanted to be a sculptor, and I got to a point to where I didn't, I didn't I'm not, I'm not going to be an artist. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off in a different venue. You know. And then at August Santa College, I had a, a professor over there. He um, talked me into taking this crash course they were gonna have for two weeks at August. And um, so I uh, said, oh, okay, I'm gonna try it, you know. And after that second day, I, it hit me just like that. I'm a sculptor, I'm not, um, I'm not, Paint. I, even though I still kind of paint, um, and I definitely can't draw. You know, and, uh, anytime it comes to a drawing, I always have to go to somebody else and say, "Draw this up for me." And you know, but um, you know, what's um, all, all you know, in nineteen like let me just jump back to nineteen sixty one. I um got married that year. My first son was born that year. Martin Luther King comes to Sioux Falls that year. Uh, Bullet Bob Hayes, he tied the world's record in the 100-yard dash out in Hardwood. And speaking of Hardwood, uh, I went to a professional football game. And uh, it was the first year that the Vikings they called themselves the Vikings, Augustana Vikings, the Vikings. So I went to that game <coughs> and they played the Dallas Cowboys. And Dallas beat them. The very first preseason football game that um, Minnesota Vikings ever played was played here. Yeah. And the Cowboys beat them. And I'm a Cowboy fan. I've been a Cowboy fan ever since 1961. And you know, it's not something really against the Vikings, besides, um, I don't like them. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't like the Vikings, you know, I never have, you know. Um, but, um, uh, you know, to kind of come forward, I'm kind of a, I'm an activist, you know. Uh, I'm always, um, <clears throat> I was always out ahead of myself. You know, the black people in Sioux Falls had to live a certain life. And um, I thought I wanted, I wanted more, you know. I wanted more when it comes down to, um, you know, their racist attitude and all that kind of stuff. That's why I was really after something. And then after going through this great big process of making sure that they went through affirmative action. Um, I was uh, I was making a lot of enemies. And 
So I, I backed up into, you know, backed up into sculpture. I can let sculpture talk for me, you know, because usually when I talk, um, people don't understand me anyway, you know. And I, um, I got into recording black history here in South Dakota. That's the medium I'm in right now. Um, uh, as you can see up here, there's um, six sculptures, and all of them have something to do with South Dakota. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been to our museum. Yes, I have. You have? I interned with Cody um, at the Washington Pavilion. Okay. So um, I spent a whole day dusting and cleaning in there. Really? <laughs> Scared a few children <laughs> yeah. when they were walking past, but yeah. So yeah. it was yeah, fun. All the sculpture here is in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm really the founder of the museum. Yeah. And I am. Um, Oh, and I'm kind of a historian, kind of. You know, if it's got something to do with black history, then I'm into it. If it doesn't have it, I don't know. You know, it's just like, uh, um, oh, I, I'm into history, you know. But what really got me started was a man named York. Okay. York was the first black man, recorded black man, to ever come to South Dakota. He come with Lewis and Clark, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know, uh, and I portrayed York. Matter of fact, in, in 2004, the year that I mean, uh, the 200 year of anniversary of, of Lewis and Clark expedition, mm -hmm. I actually joined a group out of Missouri and had replica boats, and I actually come up the river to certain points. One, uh, one deal that's outstanding to me is that when I come into my hometown of Atchison, Kansas, um, on July 4th, is when um, uh, Clark and the group, um, you know, named it uh, Independence Creek. That, and I swim in that creek. Wow. Oh, that enters into the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, there was like, um, you know, I always wanted to get into that Missouri River, and it was my opportunity to do it, you know. And so um, I spent a lot of time with York. You know, matter, <clears throat> matter of fact, too much time. And a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's more interesting when you can actually like see the impact of history and like the actual like evidence of it. Where when I moved here, it was hard to see that because Sioux Falls is still so new. Um, but uh, I grew up in South Carolina and Columbia, mm. and you're just surrounded by it all the time. And so I think that's a re big reason why I was able to get into it because I could actually see it. Mm -hmm. so, that's really cool, though. Yeah. <laughs> that, would, that would be a lot of fun, I would think. To actually oh, yeah, it was. It was it was great, and to meet guys with uh, you know, um, with the attitude that those guys had, they were fully into Lewis and Clark and the expedition, mm -hmm. compared to the group was here in Sioux Falls or South Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, what a um, a different point of view that they had, you know, and the point of view that they had is they're still in a mindset of Custer's last stand, mm -hmm. and. And all their reenactors, you know, they didn't want nothing to do with Native Americans. Yeah. And uh, that's the reason why I joined that that group from Missouri, is because uh, if you don't have anything to do with the Native Americans, you had something to do with them all the way through the whole expedition. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, where are you just going to pick out a spot where you're going to lean in there and say, well, we did this and we did that. Mm -hmm. And then I figured out, no, 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 these guys, uh, they're not into this um, expedition. They like to pick and choose right. which ones. Yeah, I remember um, when I was really little, we also lived in Tennessee. Um, I think that's where Meriwether Lewis was from. And I don't know why, but we were selling our house and it was during my birthday. And we went to the spot where he tried to commit suicide. Mm. And it's like, 
you don't really get to hear, you only hear about their expedition, and which is like once they get to Missouri, that's kind of it that you learn about. And then right, like after. Like really, yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard tell that he tried to, they say he tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, did he eventually? He suicide? passed away from his wounds, yeah. yeah. He wasn't. And the thing is, is that it's hard for me to believe that he tried to commit suicide. Shot himself twice, mm -hmm. oh, you know. It seemed like uh, one shot, and I don't care where it was at; it would hurt so yeah. bad that uh, you know. Um, I don't know. It was uh, it was different. I can remember when I we came into Atchison, Kansas, on those boats, mm -hmm. and Atchison, Kansas is only probably twelve thousand at that. At, at, no, I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, and um, in 2004, there was probably, you know, right around that same population. Well, I was just amazed of how many people were there. There must have been 30,000 people there. Yeah. I come up there and I looked at that and, and I thought, wow, this is really something. And so they had the, uh, the governor and a senator and um, the guy that portrayed York, a clerk, and uh, then they want to be up there at also. So I went up and they went through their speeches and everything. <clears throat> then they introduced me. And I told them, I said, you know, I know, I looked out at all these people. I said, I know you've been led to believe that it was the Lewis and Clark expedition. But I'm here to tell you it was the Lewis and Yark ex expedition. Yeah. <laughs> they, broke, they, <laughs> they broke up, man. They just, you know, they thought that was you know, a shot. And then the guy from that plays um, uh, Lewis, um, no, Clark, he, um, um, when after it was all done, he says, what you think of that? And I said, well, it rhymed. And there's, yeah. you know, what can I say to 30,000 people, you know? Yeah. And so it, um, it was quite an experience. But then I, um, you know, wanted to do something about history, black history in South Dakota, because mm -hmm. they don't talk about it. Yeah. You know, it's just like what there's going on right now, um, you know, down in Florida, they don't, they don't want to teach anything about black history. Well, wait a minute, now if you don't want to talk about black history, let's not talk about white history. Are you trying to include, if you're trying to include everything, that's fine. But if you want to, you know, as a cutoff point, you don't mm -hmm. want to talk about slavery, you don't want, uh, you know, you don't want you to get into civil rights, you know, the lynching and all the things that black people had to go through. But um, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, um, before, because I went to elementary school in South Carolina, before all this stuff started to happen, um, they... They did a pretty decent job at teaching um, about slavery and black history. Really? And then, yeah. Um, I remember our first field trip, they took us to a cotton field mm -hmm. and they were like, okay, you can go out. And as we're like walking out, they're like, you will be caught by the plant and there's going to be fire ants and there's going to be snakes. So watch out for that. And I just remember it was miserable. Yeah. It was just, everyone was unhappy at the end. We were all covered in fire ant bites. And um, the plant, it has like barbs on it. And so if you like touched it, your like whole arm would get red. Mm -hmm. And it was just, and we we're like, and they're like, so now think of this, but you're doing it all day, every day. And you're carrying it on your back. And you're like, doing this all the time all year long and we're just like oh, oh oh and so it actually going out and seeing what it would be like even though it's not exactly how it would be mm -hmm. just makes you think like oh my gosh mm -hmm. i was just talking to a friend of mine last night about he's a republican and he knows that i'm a snobby democrat and he got he says well you know republicans freed the slaves and I says, yeah, but, you know, gave us freedom as what, you know? I says, one thing that was happened then, my great-grandfather was promised 
40 acres and a mule, which I never, you know, we never got. We never got that 40 acres or a mule. Um, it was after the freedom of the slaves for the next 100 years, black America just struggled and struggled and struggled until uh, civil rights. And civil rights kind of uh, worked its way in there. And that's when they started talking about, uh, what's it, apparition? Affirmative action. Oh, no, affirmative apparition, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And that was really, they were trying to all of a sudden make up for all the wrongdoing that was happening. And then black people started coming up in different, all kinds of ways, you know, uh, that we contributed to America. And um, um, they just didn't, they didn't want to talk about it. The Republican yeah. Party don't want to talk about it. And so um, they're saying that was then, this is now. Okay, that's fine. I, I can go along with that. But how do we bridge that gap? You know, how do we bridge that gap at 300 years of, of discrimination? You know? And, you know, it's not as, uh, it's not as tough now as uh, it was back, you know, let's just say 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. you know, things have gotten better over the time. Um, I don't know what, you, I don't know, I'm really, I'm really afraid that we're, Stepping back in time, you know, and then the, th the real thing is that, especially in those uh, cities where they have ghettos and stuff like that, and black kids don't understand one thing, you have to have an education. That was the whole difference. I wish that I went to school and, and got an education, you know, um, some way, some way, as I'm saying, you know, an education would, would have helped me with mm -hmm. my my attitude, my everything happened, you know, in Sioux Falls. Um, but I, um, uh, oh, I've gained a lot, you know, I'm here, I'm 80 years old, and I, uh, um, you know, I, I have a, uh, my future, the thing that, you know, like when I was up in Brookings talking, and I introduced myself as Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And I have a dream. And I pointed to Zach and, and our, the head of our museum now. I said, that's my dream. That's my dream that they'll carry on and open it up for everybody, you know? Yeah. And maybe, you know, and, and I can actually, you know, because I lived in it, I can actually see where uh, it's falling back. And they're going back and they're trying to do things all over again. And then I, uh, I see like down south where they have a lot of um, um, Confederate statues and everything, yeah. and they're pulling them all down. I can understand that. You know, I, I, in a way I can, in a way I can. Because um, if you, you're, you're trying to erase a part of the history that happened. Yeah. And so uh, um, when you, you know, walk into a park, and there's uh, Robert E. Lee on a horse or something. <clears throat> well, it makes you think about slavery. These people actually wanted slaves and slavery to happen. And if you, the thing is, you jerk all that down, and you don't understand that when it comes down to, you know, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in this country, um, we can't forget about the 100 years. There's just no way you can pull down everything you want. Um, uh, I don't know, but what, what, what we do, like here in South Dakota, George Washington had slaves. And uh, um, uh, what am I thinking about? Um, so. I guess we should probably get back on the question. All right. Um, what form of art making did you first start out with? I first started out with being a kid. I remember I liked to draw all the time. Mm -hmm. And I um, all night, and I used to try to make things all the time. Mm -hmm. And so that, that part of me still, I can't draw. <laughs> and, but 
and I could make things, you know. Uh, I can remember in Kansas when I was about in the third or fourth grade, um, I made a uh, Davy Crockett oh. uh, puppet thing deal. Yeah. And, uh, and I can remember that it, they had kind of like a contest who had the best, and they picked mine out as the best thing to, um, and they took it to some kind of something in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I never did see it again. <laughs> and I worked really hard at that, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I should have, I should have known at that time that I was three dimensional. But I get, kind of took some balsa wood and stuff and made the head and let's say I made the, the uniform that yeah. they, they tried to wore. And um, uh, the bare feet that I had in and then, um, I'd like to know what whatever happened to that, you know, but I'm, I'll never find it now. You know. Yeah. But um, I, I uh, actually stayed with art for a long time. A lot of people in Sioux Falls don't know that. Because Sioux Falls, you know, you take, um, before Sculpture Walk and a few other things, mm -hmm. history, I mean, uh, art was not their bag. Yeah. You know, and so I... I don't know, I kind of, you know, stuck with it and you know, eventually, you know, I, I gave away all my paint, oil paint, brushes and the whole thing, because I'm not going to be an artist. So then I uh, picked up sculpture. Mm -hmm. That's me, that's what I, I am, you know. Yeah. Uh, what training in art have you done throughout the years? Oh, <laughs> like here in Sioux Falls, I um I don't know if you did you have you ever been to Sherman Park? I probably have. I, I built a wall oh. over there, and you know if you come down 18th Street and mm -hmm. you go straight away, you know it's a stylized image of five buffalo and Native American on a horse chasing them. You know? Okay. Um, I don't know if you know about Sixth Street Hill cobblestone. Mm -hmm. I took all those stone out, put them all back. Because they had to do underground work, and so they had to yeah. move them all and put them back. Um, uh, the kids' mosaic wall downtown. Okay. Yeah, that's. Um, it was really my. Not what they did, you know, because the kids did that. But I wanted to do a mosaic wall down that whole stretch. So I knew this artist lady at Hawthorne School. And then I talked to a few people like Stuyvesant's Kyle and a few people donated money and time and everything. Yeah. And so they, the kids did a drawing. And this art teacher, she uh, put together the drawing for them. And they, um, uh, that was the first phase. That was the... Uh, grammar school yeah. and she sent that off to a place that could make tile out of it and that's how it was done um, and then it went it was three phases uh, mm -hmm. grammar school um, middle school and high school okay. it graduates as you go up that yeah little deal. and I really tried to back up when they wanted to do it you know media they wanted the, the media to try to um, uh, come out and talk about my part in it. And I told them I don't have a part in it. Yeah. You know, because I, uh, everybody knows who I am. And I wanted the children uh, to get everything. Yeah. All of it. Because, you know, like, I don't know how many years ago that was, but I know that some of them are older and they can go down and see that, see that drawing right, that part of it right there. I did that. Mm -hmm. You know, they can connect. With something, yeah. you know. Um, oh, and then I, Kenny Anderson. I have a, a sculpture of him over there. Uh, you ever heard of Captain Eleven? I doubt it. Uh, he was a children's um, deal they did on KPLO. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> did a sculpture out front of KPLO one <clears throat> of this Captain Eleven. Um, Rosa Park School. I did this high relief, and on it I have a sculpture of Rosa Parks in this relief, and then I have a bus in there. Um, 
and she focused it on him. Mm -hmm. and, and underneath I have a smoke hit right in and said, Rosa sat down and America stood up. And I was really the, the that was the beginning of civil rights mm -hmm. where, and, um, where all of America, you know, stood up. We didn't ever had civil rights unless um, there's so many, if white America wanted to come along to help us get it, you know, and that's what happened. We can do all the, black people can do all the protests they want, but until white America comes along with them mm -hmm. and they show us the hey, this is what's happening, that's the only way things need to change. Yeah. You know? And it was just like when we had a, um, oh, they had a demonstration for uh, Floyd. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was actually it was down at Banner Square where I have a Martin Luther King yeah. sculpture. Um, and man, I was just amazed. I mean, in my whole, all oh, everything that I've tried to do in Sioux Falls, <clears throat> nothing compared to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely nothing. You know, there must have been, I would say, 4,000 people there. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and ninety five percent of the people that were there were white, and so it, it was just opened my eyes that wow, you know, we are we are making it. And if we, I see, that's the reason why um, they really want to not teach black history is because too many of the young white children are starting to say, well, wait a minute, no. <laughs> uh, Nobody talked about this, mm -hmm. you know. We'd like to let's let's find out what really happened. What is the difference between um, <clears throat> monetarily? How come white people have everything, black people have hardly anything? Mm -hmm. Well, it all stems back to 1619, when those twenty some out twenty slaves mm -hmm. came to the United States and as slaves and. So you got a you got two hundred years of slavery, and then another hundred years of all oh, just racism, you know. But you know things get better. You know, it's like the city of uh, Sioux Falls, they paid for that sculpture um, of Martin Luther King, and uh, I just had the you know the honor of making the sculpture and introducing that to the city of Sioux Falls. <clears throat> and that was a positive thing. I, um, you know, the legislator for three years, they, um, out in Pier, mm -hmm. and we went out there for three years and they'd always honor uh, Black History Month. But this year they, they wouldn't honor and I realized that's, that was a that was a step backwards for us. And then other events happened that I can that I can see. Mm -hmm. It's hard for um, the generation that that actually runs the museum and that whole yeah. all thirty five year old and a little bit older. Uh, they can't see it, you know. And I'm. <clears throat> I'm not going to really interfere with that deal because um, it's their future. You know? um, so, why were you drawn to 3D art rather than 2D art? Well, because um, I'm, I make things. Mm -hmm. You know, when I say I make things, it's like that wall, that six feet hill. And, um, different things like all this stuff that's down here. I, I do that in my spare time, you know, um, when I'm not sculpting. Sometimes yeah. I have to get away from the sculpting to be able to look back and, 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 and to get the image that I want. You know. But uh, um, it has, um, I don't know, it's just, my purpose, my, you know, a lot of people, they can live a whole lifetime and never find their purpose of living at all. They were just here, 
they're gone. You know, I always wanted to, in a roundabout way, that I wanted people to understand that I truly had a purpose in life. You know, um, other than that, um, oh, I don't know. What else do you have there? Uh, can you explain the crash course that you took at Ozzy for the sculpting? Well, the crash course, it was two weeks every night. And um, uh, um, Professor uh, Dalrymple. Okay. He was uh, the, the first sculpture I ever did. It was a white man. It was Dalrymple. Okay. And I got into that one that, as I worked with that clay and, and you know, uh, uh, and I was, it seemed like the growth of it all. I mean, you know, just doing that two weeks that I figured out that I can do anything. I can do anything with this sculpture, you know, anything but animals and horses and stuff like that. I, I tried to do a horse and yeah. it didn't work out. But I'll you, you know, that was a few months I was hanging around the sculpture class, uh, really got me in, in touch with what I really wanted out of life. Mm -hmm. And then as I went on, I went to Pier once and I went to their Heritage Museum. Yeah. And as I was walking through the museum, I went through it and everything, and I come across this Ku Klux Klan man mannequin. Uh, the Girl Scouts on one side of the deal, and the Boys Club or whatever is on the other side. And so I started looking for um, black people. I searched that place from top to bottom, not one mention of black people. And, uh, you know, they could have said, well, you know, it was uh, the first recorded black man was York. No, didn't see nothing. Nothing like we did. We did weren't here at all. And we were here. You know, like the Buffalo Soldier. Um, uh, and they really came in and they were actually the police. Yeah. For South Dakota. You know, they're the ones that um, protected the West Indian settlers who were coming out. You know. uh, and the Native Americans would jump them and everything. Um, the Buffalo Soldiers wanted to kind of ease everything out, you know, it made it easier for people to settle in the state of South Dakota. Mm -hmm. So I thought that would be, that would, should be mentioned. And, um, and it was, it's a whole deal of ideas were going through my head uh, to the point that I, um, um, I wanted could see that they didn't want to record our history. So it's it's up to me. I took it on my shoulders to to go after this museum. It took a few years before I could actually we actually kind of put it together. Yeah. And made a museum out of it at the multicultural center. Mm -hmm. And then but there was just a problem there and the problem was that the multicultural center was really based for the children. Mm -hmm. And and then we had the museum. We had to leave the front door open where people could come in and out. And then pretty soon they locked the door. And the reason was because the bathroom thing, all the kids, and they kind of, you know, it was uh, it was just not a good fit. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to the pavilion, which was uh, <clears throat> was a, it's a good move. Yeah, you know, it gives them something to. Um, work with. Um, why did you choose bronze for casting? Oh, because bronze, that's forever. Yeah. You know, uh, now they can eliminate a lot of things and do a lot of things, but when you cast something in bronze, that is, um, that's a statement all of itself. Okay. I didn't have to go out and um, shoot my big mouth off anymore. Bronze talk for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do you work with Bronze Age then uh, to cast your pieces? 
He said, that, that's, where I, <laughs> that's where I met Rick Hogan. He was a senior at First United Parish Center. Okay. And he actually um, made the mold for my Dalrymple. And um, then he went to um, Minnesota and worked for an art teacher over there. And not a teacher. Um, what was his name? Uh, 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 and he's really a great sculptor. Um, um, I can't think of his name. Paul Gramlin, I think. Uh, because when I was over there, we uh, went over to just see Rick, a friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, I looked and there was this miniature sculpture. And I looked at that and I said, well, I said, and when I was over in Japan, mm. at Peace Park, where they dropped the bomb, there was this huge sculpture. And it was that one. And then I looked at that guy and I thought, wow, you know. Um, you know, bronze can, can actually work its way around the world, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I got, you know, that's me. You know, I'm going to have to um, record this history. And they, um, I was really having a tough time keeping it going. And met this lady named uh, Laura Renee Chandler and um, because I was thinking about oh, I, I can't take care of this place and I can't do this and I'm going to pull everything out of here and let it go. It would just be a, a dream of mine. Uh, but I met this lady, her name was Renee Chandler and she uh, she come along at the right time. When I was, when I wanted, uh, my wife was saying you're you're ruining your whole life, mm -hmm. worrying about the museum, and then trying to come home and sculpt and everything. You worry about what's going on there. The, um, and so it's, um, you know, it all began and done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell me your steps of making your pieces? Okay, I start off with an, an image that I have in my mind, you know, like, um, or pictures, mm -hmm. you know, like, like um, uh, Deadwood Dick, Nate Love. Uh, there was pictures of him, so I thought, wow, I'll, you know, just pictures of him, I'll sculpt him, I'll do, you know. So I did that sculpture of him. And then Buffalo Soldiers, where there was no really good pictures of him. And so I um, come up and I read a little bit about Buffalo Soldiers and how they got the name Buffalo Soldiers. Is because um, well, the Native Americans named them Buffalo Soldiers, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, named them that because of their uh, kinky hair. Um, they were fierce fighters, and and they were you know dark-skinned people. Uh, and Native Americans believe that that dark skin is is the magic. That dark skin was was um, was really something. Uh, that's the reason why the Buffalo Soldiers came and they got along with the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I don't know. It's um, it's been a journey. You know? Yeah. So do you build like a skeleton and build on top of that? I build a um, an armature, okay. and then off that armature, I start building, making uh, things, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, the arms, the head, and everything. And then once I get the armature done, then I can do the piece, the actual piece. And then the next step out of that is to have a mold made. Yeah. And then after you do the mold, you um, uh, pull a wax. Mm -hmm. And then once you pull the wax. Uh, because actually, your, your piece actually disappears. Yeah. The mold making, you know, oh wow. But it comes back in the wax. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, then the next step would be um, uh, to spool up everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then it goes into a shell room. They build a shell on it. Yep. And then they um, uh, cure that out. 
and little cup on it, and they drain all the, the wax out of it. Mm -hmm. And then bring bronze up to 19 to 1900 or 2000 degrees. And they pour it into that um, um, into the shell. Into the shell. Okay. And, and then, uh, then once they pour it, then they tip the shell off and it comes mm -hmm. back again. So the piece actually, you know, goes away and it comes back and it goes through these processes of, you know, what's going to happen here? Yeah. <laughs> Is it going to fail or what? You know, but Rick's really good at Rick down at Bronze Age. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been down there? Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rick and I are good friends. You know, I, I really kind of helped Rick and, and really you had talked to him into coming back to Sioux Falls and opened the foundry. Oh. You know, and so he's been doing like all those pieces Rick did. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your process for your life size um, Martin Luther? Well, that Martin Luther King right there, mm -hmm. Rick took it and uh, sent it away to a place. Oh, okay. And they actually um, uh, do something, whatever their process is, and they do it in styrofoam. Oh, oh. And they, you know, had it a few different places, they sent it back to you. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, you know, Rick has to put it together. And then I have to go down and do a little some more touch up sculpting here yeah. and there. And they have to pour all these pieces in uh, bronze. Mm -hmm. and then they have to weld it all together. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's really quite a process. Yeah. I've seen them doing some of their big pieces, but it's always hard to like envision the process of mm, making a, a life lot, size. A lot of work. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can do all the steps of it. Mm. I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, I don't have to get in there worrying about the shell. Is this going to work? Or is this yeah. going to fail and all that? And then you come home and they're worried about this deal. You can't sculpt. You can't do anything. Mm. You're worrying about that process. Um, Kenny Anderson over there, Kenny Anderson, I did the whole thing. And, uh, oh, I'm trying to think what else did I do or something. I did a, one other piece where I did the whole thing. Okay. And right, and then I figured out, oh, there are people that do this. Yeah. You know? So we get back to sculpting and, you know, take it over to the pros and let them finish it. Okay. You know? Um, do you have any artists or other people in your life that influence you in your art making? Oh. Yeah, there's a black man down in um, uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Louis. Okay. Uh, Ed Hamilton is his name. And when I was on there, Lewis and Clark deal. Mm -hmm. I actually come down to Columbia River and stuff. And we came in the um, St. Louis, uh, not St. Louis, across the river, we came into, oh, wow, um, that, where, where is Muhammad Ali from? Louisville. Louisville. Okay. And, uh, so, uh, that's where I met this Ed Hamilton. And he did all black work, but he's really, if I could only get half as good as he is right now, uh, be, uh, that'd be more than I want. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now I'm still searching and everything for my style of, of how I sculpt. Yeah. Uh, and so it, um, like I said, it's been a journey. So, would you consider your sculpture more additive than building on, than rather like subtractive and taking away clay? Oh, uh, adding on. You know, I don't. Uh, you know, I, I, mean, I, I start with, a, with an armature, and then I start building with clay. Mm -hmm. 
and then adding clay and, and working in and working in and, um, and trying to get the image that I want. So, okay. Yeah. And so, um, have you clearly worked with other like found objects and stuff like that when you were younger? Are there other kinds of materials that you've worked, worked with? with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I got. Um, when I stopped, uh, really slowed down being an uh, agitator, that's what the city of Falls would call it. I, I'm a landscaper. Okay. And I do it all kinds of landscaping. And I try to work my art in every piece. You know? And so uh, that's that three dimensional thing I have. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I walk up to them and say, I could build a wall here, some stairs here. And they look at me and they, they have come back and said, this guy, he just starts talking with his hands and everything. I wonder if he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, yeah. Whatever he explained to you, that's the way it's going to come out. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I've always been working with my hands. Yeah. Um, what do you hope to see for the future of your art and your history collection? Well, I'm like I like Zach was telling you that I, uh, I actually collect um, African American history objects, you know, a lot of negative things, mm -hmm. and I actually try to, you know, collect this stuff because uh, uh, it helps me. Uh, it helps me to realize uh, who I am. That's the reason why I wear this shackle. And uh, uh, the one thing when I first started sculpting is I couldn't I had a, I had a hard time dealing with slavery because mm -hmm. we weren't taught about slavery and what Black America went, went through. And then uh, it just it, that shackle reminds me of our history you know, and how to stick with it. I've been wearing this shackle for thirty years. And um, now this one, Rick, actually Rick. Uh, did I, I got the real thing in there, mm -hmm. but made a mold of it, and, uh, it's, and it's aluminum, oh. so it's lightweight, so, yeah. Uh, I think we've answered it all. Is there anything you want to add about your art, anything in your art itself? Well, if you go in the other room, you'll see some more of stuff that I have in clay, and, mm -hmm. you know, Zach will show you this. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah.